ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce David Pagano. David Pagano is an exceptionally talented tradesman. He is actually a, um, what do you call a person that does stained glass windows? Stained glass. A stained glasser by trade. Amazing panel beater. A boat enthusiast extraordinaire. Has these Merlin engine speed boats and all sorts of crazy stuff. But he is a, a master panel beater. And we did this last year and there was so much demand for it that we've got, we're lucky to get David back again. If you can't see what he's doing this year, we've got the screen up here <coughs> where we can zoom in. Um, so don't feel like you have to crowd in too much. And, um, but anyway, I'm going to hand over to David. Morning, everybody. I'm surprised that at 9.30 there's so many people here interested to see this. Uh, I was a bit worried that I was first off the bat. Anyway, um, as Anthony, th Anthony said, I've got a history of fixing old rubbish that's broken. And, and um, I um, basically got my trade as a panel beater while I was going to uni studying art. And uh, I spent the last 35 years restoring old cars and motorbikes and speedboats and I decided I wanted to build my own car and so part of that was to learn how to bang metal in the shape and I'm still going through that process of learning. I haven't started on the car project yet but uh, I've made plenty of panels for motorbikes now and I'm getting pretty confident with it. So um, last year I made a little mudguard section. Um, a lot of people are building cafe races at the moment and Everybody wants to modify that little seat on the back and build a cafe racer tail. So I thought yesterday I'd make this just to show you how I'd go about uh, making a tail for a motorbike. Um, <clears throat> so basically I started out just with a, a cardboard buck. You can make a buck out of timber. You can make a buck out of little bits of metal, um, foam, whatever you want as long as you can make that three-dimensional form because you snook it from the start if you don't have some sort of a plan to work off because effectively all this is is a plan. Okay, so the worst thing you can do is just start with a bit of metal and start banging in the shape and hoping it'll end up the way you want it. So it's critical that you start off making your buck and working out everything that you, how you want it to be from there. Once you've got your buck set up, then you can start lofting out your design and um, working out how you're going to make it when you get a complicated panel, as I said last year, I just made a mud guard, so it was pretty easy. It was just one bit of metal, and bang it into shape, and it turns out how you want it. When you start working with <coughs> a more complicated panel, you have to work out how, what sections and how many sections you're going to make it in. So when you see those beautiful Italian cars that are all sculptural and beautiful, they're actually a patchwork quilt under that paint. All right, so they're made out of lots and lots of pieces. Some people think they just get one big piece of steel of metal and just shape it, but it's not the case. It's a whole accumulation of small pieces of metal all welded together. And um, on this particular piece, I've decided to make it in four pieces. So I've made the, um, the base where the, your bum's going to sit. And then I've decided you can't make that in one piece either, so I've made it in three pieces. And by all means, grab all these later. But, so the front section, and then two halves. I might have been able to make this back bump in one piece, but I would have. This has to be polished when it goes on the person's bike, and it would have been really hard for me to file finish it all. So I can file finish it in the three pieces, weld it all together, and I only have to file finish where I do the welding. I've left that welding like that just to show that it's actually made in sections. Okay, is there any questions yet? No? So what I'm going to do today is I'm only going to make one of these panels here. Obviously there's no point in me making all three pieces, I haven't got a welder here to do it anyway. So does everybody understand what I'm doing? That this, it's made in four pieces and I'm only making one section. Okay. So working off your pattern, <coughs> I have to project that particular piece that I'm going to make. So as I said before, I'm making this part here. All right. So just get some tape like that. And by all means, if anybody's got any questions, just stop me.
This type's not playing ball. Okay, so I use this tape and it's going to fail on me, I can just tell. And what I'm making is my pattern to work out the shape of the glass, uh, glass, aluminium. I repaired a stained glass window yesterday too, so I've got glass on my mind. It's not going to work. Anyway, basically, I lay all the tape over the top and do it in a few layers. And then I take it off. And obviously, it'll be all curled up like the shape, OK? And then I have to lay it flat so that I can work out the shape of my material that I've got to cut. So I cut some relief lines in. And effectively, what's happened is they're the areas of the metal that have to be shrunk. Okay, so for it to go around all these corners and follow that shape, if I put that on top, you'll notice that every, all those gaps line up. See that? So I have to make the material shrink, okay, to get it to go into a compound form. Now, <coughs> so I've got my piece there. And I've got my piece of aluminium. The reason it's all warped and waffled is that I had to anneal it. Is anyone not familiar with the term annealing? Basically, it's making the material soft and malleable. So I, I wave the oxy over the top, and I put all black soot all over it. And then I turn it onto a neutral flame and warm the, warm the um, panel until all that soot's gone. Because aluminium doesn't, it doesn't change color, you don't know how hot it is. And then I quench it, and once it's quenched, it's really malleable now. So I've annealed it. What series the aluminium is it? Uh, just from the shop. <laughs> so, I hear people talking about all the different types, but I'll just go down the shop and buy aluminium. It works fine. What process do you use to anneal it? OK, you get the oxy, OK, and then I'll get a carburizing flame. Put the soot all over the top, OK? Then make it a neutral flame. You can even use a hot air gun if you want, if you don't want to waste your money on the oxy. And just warm it up until the soot's gone. And then quench it, and it's annealed. And you quench it just with water? Yeah. yeah. Do you have to quench it? Or? No, you can let it sit, but I'm in a hurry. So. Can you put those reliefs in? Yeah. they work out anything, or they just... I just get the scissors and cut around it. Yeah, I just want it to sit flat when I put it on. So there's no thermometer or anything that you nah. put them in certain places, OK? You'll find when it's all curled, when, when you take that tape off and it's all curled around, you'll just start doing cuts to make it sit flat. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll put that on top there like that. <coughs> Usually I'll just mark it out a little bit bigger than I need. And also, when you start working the material, it stretches as well. So you end up with a bigger piece than you started with. Uh, we're not going to get that end piece, but anyway, for this process, it's not that end of deal. So that's the end of that. I don't need that anymore. Let me get my tin snips. Is that 1.2? No, 1.6, this one. But you can use 2 mil as well. 1.2 would probably be a bit thin. Um, because once you start filing it, you might work through it.
Now, before you get all carried away and start hammering, work out which side you're making, because I've done it on occasion where I've made two of the same side, because I started hitting on the wrong way. So I'm making this side, okay? So I want to curve it on that way. So basically I just start trying to work rough in the shape that I want. Now you'll notice it's puckering up. That's the material saying I don't want to go where you want me to go. I don't want to shrink. Okay, so I've got to work those areas and bring that material in to allow them, the flat piece of metal to go around. Okay, so so I'll go back to my reference, okay, and I'll just keep trying to get it roughly into the shape I want, and then just sand, yeah, but you can use shot as well, lead shot if you want. Okay, so I'll use my wooden block now and I'll start shrinking the metal. You can see it's starting to take that shape, shape now. See it's puckering up there? See it's puckering up? I've got to bring that material in. They call it they call it tuck shrinking. That's the, the term. I keep going back to my form. Can you see now it's starting to go where I want it to go? So now I just start tweaking it up. I want it to curl around more there. I want to make it fuller there. had a flu for the last week and a half and I can't seem to shake it. So every single panel that you make, if you ever decide to do any of this, just involves working out whether you need to shrink the material or stretch the material, okay? And once you work out that, get competent with that, then any shape's possible. Then it's just up to how accurate you are. You can see it's starting to look like a, a nice little bump now. All right, it still needs to come out of here a bit more. So. See, it's puckering up again, so I want to shrink that back. Okay, so it's still not quite there, but. So now, 
if I had a wheeling machine here, I'd run it through the wheel to put the shape back in. And then I might decide I need to hit it more in the bag to get it where I want it to go so it sits nice on that form. But none of you have got a wheel, or some of you have. It's a lot easier to get one now than it used to be. So I'm going to finish it all off just on the anvil. Okay? So you don't need a wheeling machine. It's quicker with one, but you don't need one. So then I just get my... Um, just my rubber mallet. Now all I'm doing is just trying to smooth it out and work it. You can see now it's starting to look like something. So I'll have another bit of a look at it and I'll go, okay, I need to straighten that out there a bit. So. I think it needs to be fuller here. So I go back to my. Yeah, along there. It needs to be fuller here. So I'll. See, it's starting to come around now. Okay, and then back on here. Okay, and we just keep working on that. So now I want to bring that down there. So it's not sitting nicely against that. So I want to bring that down. So now I'll work in here and try and turn it in. And see it's puckering up again. Okay, so it's telling me I need a shrink there. See, it's coming down, but it's not sitting right there, so I want to straighten that out there. So I'll use this for that. So you, you really don't need anything too fancy to do this stuff, and aluminium's so malleable that it, it tends to be pretty easy to work with. That's pretty close now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> this tool here is 
The Americans call it a flipper, but we call it a slapper. And what it does is because I've got all these irregular highs and lows in the material, by you, instead of using a hammer, because I remember I said you had to shrink or stretch metal. Well, if you want to bring a low up, you hammer on the, on the low part, but with the dolly behind it, and it stretches the material and raises it up. But if you concentrate that in one spot, you'll create a, a peak like that. What the slapper does is it blends in the lows and the highs together. So it'll push down the high parts and stretch the material enough on the low areas to bring it up. So we use the flipper or slapper. To blend it. Starting to look like something now, isn't it? Okay. So from a warp piece of flat metal to something that looked like it was full of cellulite to something that's starting to look like a tail or a section of a tail. So I keep going back to my pattern because if you don't follow your pattern, it's going to end up a train wreck at the end. Okay. So always work with your pattern. Okay. So that's starting to look like something now, isn't it? All right, so then, because I want to polish it, I could leave it like that if I wanted to and nicky it up. Everybody hates nicky and says it's bodgy, but I'm afraid it's a part of life. But this particular customer wants it polished, so I've got to file it all up. Now, you can get a proper body file, but I find that if I use the proper body file, I make a hell of a lot work, more work for me later trying to get rid of all the scratches. So for aluminium, I use just a normal file. And what I'm doing is I'm not physically filing too much material off. What I'm doing is trying to find the highs and the lows. Can everyone see the shiny sections and the dark sections? Can everyone see that? OK, the shiny sections are the high spots. The darker sections are the low spots. So I go back to using my... Um, but, uh, slapper, I'm going to work this area here. See how nothing's touching there? Nothing's touching there. Then I get my file over the top. See, it's gone. Okay, so I've, I've, I've brought that low section up and brought the high sections down. And there's some middle ground where I stop and then I run over it with the file. So all the file's really doing is just showing me where the, where the highs and lows are. Now, if I've got a really stubborn particular area that I can't bring up that way, then I'll use my planishing hammer. So I'm going to work this one here now. All right, not that you can really see it, but there's a dent there, a low. And so I can hit straight on that low section. And what I'm doing now is I'm stretching the metal. The metal's got to go up. It'll always go to its least form of resistance, okay? So then I'll get my file. Um, I'm trying to remember where I hit now. Anyway. Uh, 
Okay, so that low that was there is gone now, or pretty much gone. And I'll just keep working it until... So I'm not going to file all this, by the way, because you get the idea. So does everybody get the idea what I'm doing? The rest of it... Yeah, exactly the same. Steel, copper, stainless. It's just... It's harder to work with, that's all. Especially stainless work hardens, it'll end up cracking. And this will work hardened too. If you're really, really doing a lot of um, working of the material, you might decide you want to re-anneal it. Okay. So, um, so then I put it back onto my mold, or my, die, my pattern. Once I've got it where I want it to be, then I'll mark out where I've got to trim it. Okay, and then I'll offer up the other pieces that are going to go together. And then I'll weld it all together. And you can either use, do it with the oxy or the TIG. If you do it with the oxy, it tends to stay um, really malleable. Um, when you do it with the TIG, it work hardens at the TIG area. You might have to re-anneal it or you try and work with it and it cracks. So then, <coughs> once you weld all the parts together, then you have to file that out and get all the distortion out again and you'll have to work it on the anvil or on the block. Um, I always grind out the inside so it's easier for me to get the dollies behind it to dress it all up. And um, eventually I'll just keep working down in the grades of abrasives until I'm down to say um, eight on 800 or 1000 grit wet and dry and then I'll run it on the wheel and polish it. And then if I'm not happy with particular spots like there's a little low spot there then I might have to put it on the anvil and tap it with the back of the pick to bring it up to get that flush. And then I'll try it out on the bike, which we did last night, work out where I'm going to trim it, and then weld those parts together and then fit it on the bike. And that's how you make a cafe racer tail. <laughs> Any questions? When you first do the, you're talking about the annealing? Uh, just basically neutral. But it's, when you weld with an oxy on aluminium, the material has to be really, really clean. You have to use a stainless steel wire brush on it too. Don't use a steel brush to clean it up. Um, and then you, you've got to use the right flux and you can't see the material melting. So you've got blue lenses rather than the green lenses. And it's really hard, it's not easy. It's really hard to do. But it's better to do it with the oxy. The only downside to doing it with the oxy is you've got to get that flux out. Because if you don't, um, when you go to paint it, it'll blister up wherever the flux was. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can we thank David Pagano, please? If you want to ask David questions, please hang around. But we've got our next...